I talked to one of my friends who, uh, who's a, he's an MBA in finance, and I said, you know, what's the purpose of college anyway? And I figured, you know, this panel, we've spent our entire careers on colleges, campuses, and teaching undergrads. We can wax poetic about, you know, the benefits of college, but what does the Garden Variety MBA say? And he said, maybe not surprisingly, well, it's to prepare to get a job. I thought, is that all? And so I pressed in, I was like, is that all? And he's like, well, you know, I guess there are the ancillary benefits of hanging out with your friends and, and things like that. So yeah, so maybe that too. And I said, well, if it's just about getting a job, you know, you could get a job without college. I mean, people do this every day. And he thought for a minute and then he refrained and he said, well, it's so you can get a job, but you start higher up on the ladder if you have a college degree. That's what it's really all about. And I thought, okay, maybe not. <laughs> but then when you think about it, you know, a lot of the ways in which we evaluate a college degree is starting salaries and job titles, right? I mean, that's, that's one of the markers. And so, well, maybe that's not too far off. And so a lot of students that in, in our book, that in, in the interviews with students in our book, they, they struggle with that. And, and one student, Dylan, um, I love Dylan. In the cue and response, uh, we could talk about Dylan. He's really great. But he said, I don't have a definite goal before me right now. And therefore, I'm just drifting around, taking courses that seem interesting. And that's probably why I'm not getting the full value of college this year. And so it's the sense that he had to have a purpose in order to get the value of college rather than college being something that you do to find your purpose. And so when I, when I juxtapose that against an experience I had a couple of weeks ago with the uh, Junior Family Weekend, and I had an opportunity to talk to a group of parents and other family members and, and just kind of the opening discussion if they had spent a day and a half with, with their college students. I said, how many of you guys want to go back to college? And like, they all raised their hand. They all want to come back here and go to college. And I'm kind of sure they don't want to come back and study chemistry or social science and land a little higher bar on the, on the ladder. They're really wanting to come back and do those ancillary things that my, my MBA friend talked about. And so it's this idea of coming to college is something beyond, you know, what we're learning in the classes. And so Mike in my, in my book, he was um, a pre-med and he said, you know, but college is good in that there's a lot of opportunities to do different things. And I think you need time in college to grow and to, and to broaden yourself. And so what college does is it gives us this gift of time. This, this gift to, to press pause on life between high school and adulthood. And even though it might not feel like you're pressing pause because it's busy and you have more reading than you could do and P sets than you can manage. And, and so it feels like you're really busy, but it really is this time to press pause. And so what should you be doing when you're pressing pause? And one of the things in our book that they talked about that they were doing is to find themselves. And they didn't actually find themselves. They were practicing how to find themselves. And so Carl, who's from a rural area in New Hampshire, he said, I kind of allowed myself to be unformed when I got here. And he, this was at Harvard. So I could sort of let this place interact. I sort of left myself open and I wasn't afraid of it. And so it was this acknowledgement of, of letting himself open, but acknowledging that there was a vulnerability to doing so and being comfortable in that vulnerability as he let himself interact with this place. And Judith, though, she was trying to press away from her parents and then decide what she wanted to do. And she wanted to make her own decisions. And she said, I was going through this phase where I was trying to get away from just what my parents had taught me about my own ideas about how things are. They wanted me to believe what they believed. And I'm trying not to allow myself to get just into accepting things just because I need to feel comfortable. I want to be able to question everything. I want to be able to reevaluate everything. And that's kind of the purpose of college is to let yourself go and be able to reevaluate it. And it doesn't mean that college isn't hard and it doesn't make you anxious, but it should make us a little uncomfortable as we adapt to new things. And, but there's an irony in this, is that it's this time to press pause, but at the same time, it's all filled up. We have this idea that we're supposed to 
get the most out of college and getting the most out of college means you're supposed to do a bunch of stuff and fill up your time. And instead, people in our book talked about not having time to do the things that they really wanted to do in college. So Gary said, you expect, you go to school and you pick up X, Y, and Z in courses, but then you find that that's not really where the important things are. Not that it isn't interesting in and of itself, but that doesn't make you a person necessarily. And so they talked about having too many pressures and not being able to do what they thought was really the purpose of college. So needing to find time and make time. And so Deborah said, I really didn't have time last year. I was trying to do everything oriented towards my major courses, which leaves little energy for anything else, which is bad. Now, Max was the opposite. He said, I enjoyed these things. And, the, and talking about the extracurricular activities and, and other courses, elective courses. And he said, the more I learned about them, the more I enjoyed them. I feel like I'm spoiling myself sometimes, taking too many things that I like and not enough of the things I ought to take. But I figured that's what I'm here for. But Mike, Mike said, and we talked about the fine arts, he said, a lot of other courses, say fine arts and humanities and stuff like that, have to be neglected. And I think that's unfortunate. And also, the extracurriculars, which are the biggest plus of being in this place, they have to be curtailed in a degree. And so how do we think about flipping the script and really think about what are the important things and how do we make time for those things? And how do we figure out how to do that? And as a Christian, I lean into Romans 12 too, which says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. And that's what the college experience is supposed to do. It's supposed to give you an opportunity to transform yourself and for your mind to be renewed. And then it goes on and it says that by testing, you may discern what is the will of God and what is good, acceptable, and perfect. And it's not this idea that you should believe things because you're told to or just because, but you're supposed to test and discern. And it's those skills I think that we learn in college. And those are the things that I think are the purpose. And so I'll end there and, and turn it over to Dean Karana. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Hill. Um, it's so great to be here with you and thank you for moderating today. Um, um, we had Professor Hill come and speak to our senior team a couple of months back um, at the college and it was just wonderful. So um, really wonderful. Thank you for inviting me. Um, so, you know, I want to maybe pick up on what you said and I'll, I'll start a little bit about what I think some of the challenges are. And I, you know, I'm going to do a very abbreviated version of the mission of the college, but then explain why I think it's challenging in, to try to enact that mission today and what, what we might be able to do about it and, and hopefully in conversation with you. So the mission of Harvard College has been for almost 400 years now to educate the citizens and citizen leaders for our society. And we do this through our belief in what we call the transformative power of a liberal arts and science education. And for us, it begins with the intellectual transformation, the social transformation, and the personal transformation. And I'll come back to what, what I think each of those mean, but particularly spend time on the intellectual a little bit and the social um, because I think the context has changed. So while the purpose that you so eloquently pointed out for college, I think has stayed the same, I think the context in which we're operating has changed in 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 many ways. And obviously COVID um, brought that to the fore. It was a very humbling experience for um, our institutions and particularly Harvard. Um, and I think it's a humbling you know, experience for all of us as a global society. We know that I think something like um, 6 million people have already passed away from COVID and hundreds of millions have had it and, and became ill. And so um, I also know that, you know, our students lost time, right? And time is not an infinite resource. It's not something you can save or bank or uh, use for another day. And that impact also was compounded by social isolation um, and educational outcomes that we, I, I think, will take us many years to understand um, as they play out. And... You know, on the other side of what COVID also brought, it, it did kind of halt the machinery a little bit or slowed it down pretty um, incredibly, which gave us, I think, a chance to look at it, a, a kind of point of arrival in society and maybe a point of arrival as a higher education institution. Um, and, you know, uh, my colleague, Nicholas Christakis, who's a fellow sociologist and also a, a medical doctor, he used to be here, he's at Yale now, 
Um, he wrote a book on pandemics, and he pointed that you know pandemics are disruptive in very unique ways, unlike some other social events, in the in that they're punctuated, uh, but they set in motion events whose causality can only be established through hindsight, not foresight. And I think that's a so I also tread very cautiously to think about like what COVID meant for higher education, um, but I think we can point to some things that we saw. Um, in, in this motion, in, in, in this area, which was that we weren't just in a health crisis, uh, we were in a social crisis, um, polarization, inequality, um, justice, all of these things that literally threaten our democracy uh, in this nation. Um, and I think they also, you know, Nicholas also points out another thing is that pandemics bring out both the best in humanity and the worst in humanity. I think we saw examples of selfishness and a lack of respect, but we also saw like an embrace of people and neighbors, and in particular, uh, our essential workers, and how critical they are to the daily functioning of our society. Um, and I think COVID highlighted how important and I think critical a residential um, liberal arts and sciences education is at this moment, but also the danger and challenges that I think it faces uh, in today's world. And um, so for the first one, you know, I think it's on around the intellectual transformation. So when I talk about, we talk about the intellectual transformation at the college, it's the goal is to develop an independent mind, to learn to think for oneself, to appreciate the role of reason and evidence, to search for veritas, the truth, but also recognize that the truth is not easily attained. Um, it has to be discovered, uncovered, discerned. And moreover, it requires a sort of stance of humility um, because things that we were so certain to be true at one point turn out to be more contingent or complex or not even true at all. Um, and I think that part of what, you know, education teaches us is that part of how we learn to think for ourselves is through dialogue and exposure to different perspectives and different ways of thinking. All of the things that you described that your interview um, um, subjects, you know, revealed. Um, and I think one of the things you also learn is that not everybody's always interested in the search for truth. Uh, that the search of truth, which is a human activity, also exists among other human activities, including the search for dominance and power. Um, and, and so we have to also recognize this is not an easily uh, done thing. It doesn't make it any less valid, but I think understanding the complexities of that um, um, means that, you know, that search for the accuracy of the world is, is more difficult. And um, I think the COVID context, has, one thing that it really revealed is the role of social media. Uh, in many ways, and how it interplays with education and the search for truth. Um, I think in particular, um, and I think many of our students and faculty and all of us are subject to it, is that our attention has increasingly been turned into a commodity. Um, it is something that's manipulated and it is bought and sold. Um, and the things that started out for us, and I just saw this yesterday with a, there was an article about another app that's out that, you know, students are using, um, uh, I think side chat, side, did I get that right? Okay, right, so uh, these things always start out, and I, you know, I'm a tech person, I worked in tech for, uh, in my starting companies, um, but, y you know, um, th they start out as sort of humorous distractions, um, and, and I think as we saw during COVID, whether it was streaming a video or watching, some short videos or um, that these human distractions are kind of actually organized by algorithms, which then turn into habits. Um, the habits become reflexes and the reflexes become addictions, right? And that's actually what the business model is. And I'm a professor at the business school, so I have no, uh, you know, I'm a private in the capitalist army. Um, but it's funny to me the terminology that's used increasingly as part of business plans. Uh, terminology we used to associate with chronic diseases, uh, binging, addiction, um, you know, virality, <laughs> having something go become viral, um, and that this is like now endemic to a business plan, which is this is the goal, is to actually to create binging, addiction, and make something viral. And I think it's just something that should give us some pause because these are choices that have been made. It's a system in which it could have broadened us, broadened our exposure to ideas, broadened our exposure to other different perspectives, and instead actually it's had the opposite, which is the narrowing function. And it is a machinery wired to, to do that and programmed to do that. And it's done so in a way that you don't even have a human agent anymore uh, that's doing it, right? There's no sort of moral compass 
of somebody making a decision about where they're directing behavior. There's an algorithm that's sort of self-learning and um, in, in, in doing this. And I think, um, again, you know, uh, this steady drip of dopamine and, you know, exciting certain parts of our emotional state, um, uh, you know, again, very understandable, but I think this has not been an innocent exercise. Um, and when you think about education in this context, especially our own education model, it makes us vulnerable uh, in many ways, where we prefer outrage over a nuanced discussion and that the rage itself uh, is sort of seen as entertainment. And I think so we can see this, and I think the impact this has on education is that the context makes discussion of differences and points of view and nuanced conversation much harder, which is essentially what educational institutions do. And it makes it harder because in many ways, when I've uh, you know, talked to students about this, they are so fearful about having certain kinds of discussion that it enforces a kind of conformity of thinking. And this conformity shows up in two different ways. One is a kind of fear of being labeled some kind of ist of some type and as a result, people don't say what they really believe, and outwardly they look like there's agreement. Now, inwardly, when there's a distance between how you express yourself outward and inward, the, what the result is often a dissonance, but also a sense of shame. Mm -hmm. um, because you feel like, why can't this exterior and my interior be more aligned and closer to my, my true self? Or the flip side is that if you're a person who's like constantly you know, constitutionally in incapable of like going along with that, you're ostracized. And now you're outside and now you also feel a sense of shame or you are shamed. Mm -hmm. And I think if both of those things, are, those are not healthy places for human beings to be, you know, to be. And, you know, I, we, as I was saying at dinner, I, I'm, I'm kind of, my wife would describe me as Max Weber's, you know, religiously unmusical. Um, but I know that those feelings really are at the essence of human dignity. Mm -hmm. And, 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 and the ability to express oneself is so essential to human dignity. You don't know who you are until you can express yourself. The expressive act is one in which one discovers oneself. And so if going back to the you know, quotes that you read, if part of what college does is give you the apparatus and the tools to construct oneself in an intentional way, to become the person, to first figure, figure out who you are before the world told you who you were, but also to figure out who you want to be, and you can't engage in that kind of exploratory space, I think it does present a significant kind of challenge. Um, I think you know, part of how we can you know, meet the challenges of that is I think our residential system, which was something that I think all of us painfully felt the absence of during, um, which is that in those spaces, you can take off the sort of mask of performativity, uh, especially if you develop good relationships with people, healthy, respectful relationships that are sort of built on trust and respect in which you can share your thoughts, in which you can be vulnerable about your thoughts. Because I think in those kind of conversations, when one is vulnerable, it often creates a space for somebody else to be vulnerable. And out of that shared humanity comes dialogue and alternative possibilities for the future. But that is really hard to do if constantly you feel you're under the gaze of a kind of judgment of the herd I mean, the herd, yeah, the, the herd's judgment. And it's kind of, you know, ever present. I, I, mean, I used to like watch the Lord of the Rings. It was like this eyeball on top <laughs> of this mountain that like, you know, like, is that the way we have, all have to kind of like hide from that? And it, that, that, that gaze, I think actually of, of, of the crowd um, inhibits and it feels ever present and more omnipresent um, everywhere. And I think what we have to do again, getting to the same goals, is how do we create spaces for both recognizing you know, our vulnerabilities, recognizing our multiple identities, recognizing that we also are bundles of believing A and B doesn't necessarily mean you also believe D and E, um, and that you're still wondering about C. Um, and not to be able to engage in that and have people assume all of that, I think really kind of inhibits the potential of the transformative power of our education, so. Uh, I want to thank the Veritas Forum for inviting me and, and sharing 
the stage with such esteemed scholars. Uh, I want to start for uh, with uh, with a, a more practical question before I go. I delve deeper into some of the uh, arguments that you have introduced about purpose and vulnerability and independence. A more practical question related to the pandemic. Uh, the pandemic has shown and that uh, some form of online learning is possible. And yet, uh, and this is a question that comes from, from our students really, yet we feel like there's something missing there. And so my question, maybe if we could start from Professor Hill, is does in-person learning enhance a special sense of purpose? Thank you for the question. You know, we did learn a lot from the pandemic. And, you know, at the beginning of the pandemic, there was this question whether or not online college were going to be we're going to win the day and that the residential college experience was going to be considered a thing of the past. And I think what we learned is that that's not true, that there's that all of these things that were taken for granted, the ancillary things, turned out were the most important things of all. They were the things that we came back for, the things that we missed. But up until this point, we haven't been able to name them because we didn't know we were to miss them. And I think there is a place for online learning around knowledge gain and credentialing. And when you think about people who don't have the privilege of a residential college experience, there, you know, there is that point of getting a certification or getting a college degree that opens financial doors and professional doors. But is that all college is supposed to be? And from my work looking at, at uh, families and students that come from a diverse range of backgrounds, if we can name what these other things are that come with a residential college experience that matter for who we are and how we think and how we interrogate ideas, how we live in community, one of the things that we learn from a college experience that's, that you just take for granted is that we all learn to pick up our roots and move someplace else, live with someone who we may know or like we don't know, and build community. And if we're going to be a global society, if we're going to learn to embrace differences, the first thing we learn at a residential college is how to build community when we come in knowing no one. How do we find people that, that we can feel like we can be in community with? And those early days in, in residential college are hard. People are lonely in those first semester of their freshman year. But we learn how to find community. And then we take that skill and we take it with us. And when we leave, when we move someplace else, and every time we move to take a new job or do something else, we take that skill of how to find and build community with us. And so it's those kind of skills that just come with going to college that we don't name that are the kinds of, of experiences that shape who we are. And so I think there is a place for online learning, for credentialing and knowledge. We can all watch TED Talks and, and things like that and, and, and get factual knowledge. But it's knowledge from an individual that you can't talk back to. And I think, you know, as uh, Dean Karana was talking about, it's in that engagement of being vulnerable and, and sharing ideas and doubts and I'm not sure and convince me, I'm going to convince you, but doing it in a, in a way that is that preserves the dignity of the human, as you, as you described, uh, Dean Karan, is that we, how do we talk about the dignity of the person and disagreeing with the ability to forgive and restore? Dean Karan. Yes, it's, it's a great question. And um, I think, you know, uh, the second element I talked about was social transformation, which is, you know, what we try to do is embed that education in a diverse living and learning environment where Students learn to see behind each other's eyes, to hear from another's perspective, um, to learn how to disagree without being disagreeable. Yeah. Um, and also to see our diversity, I think, as a source of infinite possibility. And part of it is, is that many, so much of our community is so stratified in our society that people don't really live, you know, people have experience being minorities, but that's not the same thing as living and learning in a very diverse environment. And, and because of the stratification of our society, college is often the first place mm -hmm. that people um, have an opportunity to do that. So, you know, one of the things I do study is the sociology of elites. And, you know, one of the things that is be careful of what elites are recommending to other people and versus what they do for themselves. Uh, you very rarely see elites opting for online educations for their children. 
but it's something they're glad to sort of shovel out to everybody else. And I want to make a distinction between what I would call education and training. Training is what you do for like simplistic tasks, and it's also sometimes not even associated with people. Education is something different. Mm -hmm. um, education is the asking of questions. It is about critical engagement. Um, it is not simply about the transmission of knowledge in a kind of mindless way. It's about the engagement with how that knowledge was created, the questions and the people who created the context in which it's done. And I think we often confuse the two um, because one you know, seems to have a kind of utilitarian kind of quality to it, but it doesn't educate you for citizenship. It doesn't teach you to ask the why. Mm -hmm. And I think elites have an interest in not having too many people ask why that it's better for people to just sort of accept the authority, uh, to expect, you know, accept it in an uncritical way. And I think that's very dangerous for democracy because in the gap of that gets filled with half-truths and in the gap for that or uncritical, uh, you know, uh, reception of some charismatic leader and whatever the sort of aspect they, they sort of shout out. And so for me, I agree that it is... Well, the kind of education that we're talking about is, 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 um, requires resources to produce, but every child should have and every person should have entitlement to it. I don't want to have two different systems. You're the trained and you're the educated. Um, I think everybody should be able to have that kind of experience and that option. And I think a society that is truly interested in its sort of long-term well-being uh, will do everything it can to create that opportunity and that possibility. This is not to move away from the importance of the utility aspect of education. I think being a productive citizen um, is important and having education that prepares you well. But I think part of what we also have is elites discounting the importance of that kind of education. Um, when you look at work like David Deming's, which emphasizes the importance not of the technical skills, which turn out to have a very short half-life, but the importance of you know, what they call the soft skills, um, those have to, you can't train people in them. They have to be developed and they require time. And, and so I think part of what I see is that the current system, which already is so stratified and unequal, uh, this tendency toward training uh, is only going to amplify those inequalities because I think there is a distinction there. Um, and so what we miss in all of this is that if you just do a simple cost-benefit analysis, what we do will not look efficient. And again, I am a professor at a business school. I care about efficiency, but I also care about effectiveness. And I think that's a different thing. And I think if we spend too much time on efficiency, we won't talk about exactly those, you know, those periods, as you said, the time that you're not doing anything, mm -hmm. where you're getting to reflect on yourself. Um, you, know, you put that in another type of society, people think time is money. Well, when did people say that I get to decide what you do with your time? And I think these are the kinds of things where we can't, we have to find a different way. I feel the logics that we're using, the utilitarian logic, is kind of just getting in the way of understanding why education is so important and how critical it is for an engaged participatory democracy. Thank you so much for your answers. Um, I have a question about uh, what you study. You're world-leading scholars in different fields, yet you both study change. Mm -hmm. uh, Professor Hill, you study life-changing, life-altering transitions. Mm -hmm. And uh, then uh, Karana, you study organizational change. And I'm going to start with Professor Hill. Uh, how does college prepare us for those kind of life-altering mm -hmm. transitions? Um, Should it? Yes. <laughs> yes, it does. And, um, and it should. And I think, you know, what we find when we, in this kind of college experience and how it prepares us for change, is that we're, we're learning to figure out who we are. We're trying things on. We're learning to evaluate. What we, what we learn in our research on on college students and adolescents is that we kind of turn it on its head, that people will say adolescents and the college years are the time to find yourself. And they, they are and they're not. That 
you know, we always thought, well, we're going to have a chapter on, on how college students find their identity. And they don't. But what they learn is the process of finding their identity. They learn the mechanisms of reinventing themselves again and again and again. You know, to Dean Carano's point, we're not learning how to train ourselves. We're learning how to take apart arguments. We're learning how to reinvent ourselves again and again and again. And you start that process in high school where you, know, you begin to figure out who you are. You're beginning to think about yourselves in, in, in abstract ways. But when we get to college, it's the first time we get to do that apart from the community that shaped us originally. So you get to try this out. And you fall, and we make mistakes, and then we, have to, and we thought we came here to study something, and then we realized that we really don't want to do that, or I only thought I wanted to do that. And so we learn to reinvent ourselves again and again, and we try it out in college, and then we do it again and again for the rest of our lives. Every time we have a new life stage, you get married, you have kids, you change your job, you reinvent yourself at 40, 40, 45 is that next developmental stage where people reinvent themselves. It's not really a midlife crisis. <laughs> but you reinvent yourself and then you say, you, you take stock. And you take away the things that you've done with the first half of your adulthood and you reinvent yourself into, and take with you what you want and, and change what you want. But how do you learn how to do that? And those are the, the ways in which we study development and change. And the college experience is key for doing that. And it's not what we're learning in courses. It's what you're doing up in all the other parts of the college experience. I have a related question for uh, Dean Karana. Uh, I follow you on Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if, if you haven't seen Dean Karana's Instagram, I strongly recommend it. It's it's a beautiful uh, collection of pictures of life on campus. And there was one post, though, where you posted a resume of rejections. Tell us more about that and, and if you believe that there is a, there is a lesson there uh, for, for our students. Um, yeah, my kids always make fun of my Instagram. They used to tell me, like, how bad it was and, like, <laughs> you know, like clean your lens and stuff they would write in the comments section. Um, and so um, uh, thank you for following me on Instagram. Um, you know, I, when I posted that resume the first time, you know, part of it is, is like when I became dean of the college, I, you know, and I still do, but you know, you're like, you feel like a total imposter. I know that's like a cliche now to talk about imposter syndrome, but you know, faculty feel it too, or at least this one does. Um, and being Dean, you know, I didn't even get into Harvard. Um, it's easier to become Dean, uh, than it is to get into the college. <laughs> <laughs> and also like I transferred to Cornell from SUNY Binghamton and there was all these things like, you know, I had spent my life trying to like not talk about like, you know, and I realized like how much I was like kind of painting an illusion in some ways, you know, or a kind of abbreviated narrative of, and, and, you know, I, I was like, you know, that's not right. Um, it's not that I didn't go to Cornell. I did, but I transferred there. It's not that I, you know, didn't go to Harvard. I did, but not as an undergraduate. It's, and, and I just thought it was important to sort of talk about the nonlinearity of things and, and kind of actually the serendipity that comes out of that and, and, and that you know, that, that, you know, again, these are like sort of, I feel like targeting like, you know, these are like Michael Jordan sports quotes, but if you don't take a lot of shots, you don't get like anything in. And like part of that is you try to take a lot of shots and that there may be other ways. If it didn't go in this one way, you try it in a different way. And one of the things that, you know, as an immigrant, you tend to be very optimistic. Um, I'm, I'm an immigrant. My father, you know, my parents came here. My dad ended up in the United States because he got rejected from Uganda. So he applied to the next letter in the alphabet. I mean, that's like, you're kind of, like that's the, you know, and, and, you know, it all works out in certain ways. And so I think it was to sort of point that out, but also like, you know, there's things also just that didn't work out and that maybe going to, no matter what, how good the colleges or graduate schools you go to, it doesn't inoculate you from life. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, life presents its own challenges. Um, but if you live in community, and I think really going back to what you said so beautifully, you know, Professor Hill, um, like in all of those moments of rejection and things, I always went back to my books. Like, 
I, I always feel like books saved my life. And, 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 and books, I would go back to, to certain readings because you could like then begin to construct yourself. You could find words for feelings you had but didn't even know there were words for. You can find stories of resilience. You can find hope which I often think is more of a, a, a past look than it is a forward look. Hope is more about like, look at what my ancestors have done. Look at what other people have overcome. And you look there and then out of that comes a sense of hope. And so I think the, the, the last thing I would say is, you know, part of that was exactly what you said is those words at certain moments mean totally different things because you now are reading them in a way. When I lost my youngest brother to suicide, I went back and read things read in a totally different way about loss and grief, um, the sense of wanting to do something or turn back time. It meant a totally different thing to me at that moment when there was something real that had happened. And so, um, and then you can out of that rebuild yourself. And then I think the last thing I would say is that, you know, going back to that stuff, at some point in your life, you also figure out, this is what I believe. And even if the world is pushing at me, I have something I can just say. You have something to push back with. I can stand here, I can't do anything else because otherwise I would be negating who I am. And, and I think, so there's also something about in the face of change, what is solid? What, is, what are the values you care about? What are the things you're willing to sacrifice something for? What are the, what are, what's, what's your history that you are willing to stake your sense of meaning around? And I think, it's a combination of that. Um, that's a lot to put on that resume of rejections, but you know, it, when I look at that, it's, it's, it's also a huge, highly abridged. It could have gone on and on, um, but it, it, was, it was a kind of a way of trying to capture some of that. Thank you for that. I, I saw in, in that a beautiful lesson in vulnerability, mm -hmm. uh, coming from a place where we usually don't see it. Right, and so it speaks to that power of, of of vulnerability that Professor Hill was mentioning earlier. And uh, to Professor Hill, I wanted to ask: um, uh, amongst the things that colleges do, there's selection, right? Through the admission process, colleges select for the students that get the privilege of then eventually going through that transformative experience. And you study. Uh, that as well, you study uh, the ways in which families support students through school engagement and, and preparedness for college. Um, do you see a, uh, a contradiction there between what colleges eventually teach once you're in? They teach you, okay, you, you should allow yourself to be vulnerable. You should allow yourself to... to uh, uh, to find yourself and your identity. Yet the selection process requires, to a certain degree, a very clear sense of self. The college admissions process. Oh, the selective college admissions process. And I, there are a couple of ways in which I'll respond to your question. And, and one of it is, is that the selective college admissions process means that people have to figure themselves out as early as middle school. Like, you know, in, like, oh my, I, in, in our samples, we had students talk about, like, I had to figure out how to be on the honors level in middle school so that I would take the right math courses so that when I got to high school, I would have enough time to take enough math courses so that I could take AP classes so that I could get into the right college. And then they get to the right college and for some, it was like, I've made it. Can I press pause now? And for others, the treadmill keeps going. And so there's this sense of, in, in, in my view, what should be a time where people can reflect, they've been trained on a treadmill and they don't know how to get off of it. And then they don't get off of it until they're well into their adulthood when it's really hard to back out. And, and the select, selective college process plays to that. And what parents in, in our research 
They want the best for their kids. And society is telling them that there is a limited number of resources and a limited number of places where you can get this. So everyone's applying to the same places. And so when you think about just in the, in, you know, the, the Gazette and the Crimson was you know, the lowest acceptance rate for, for Harvard College in its history, which means, what was it, 60 some thousand applicants for 1900 spots? What are we doing? <laughs> you know, Dean Corona, you were talking about how do we, you know, how do we give this away? How do we create greater equity where we don't have those who are educated and those who are trained? But there's this dual message that the elites are the only place where you can get education and not training. But then we're not expanding access. And so then you look at, well, what are the great state schools? So I went to Ohio State. And Buckeyes. Go Bucks. <laughs> No Michiganders in here, right? <laughs> right so go box, right? And, and, and you know, my, my oldest brother, I was saying at, at, at dinner, my, um, I'm the youngest of eight. And my oldest brother is uh, 24 years older than me, and there's you know, six of us in between. And my parents didn't go to college, and they want all of us to go to college. And when my older brothers came, came of age to go to college, um, you know, they went to an HB, HBCU, so Historically Black College University, because they couldn't get in to, the, to other places. And then my oldest brother, he, he was in one of the first classes of African Americans in the Harvard Business School, class of 1971. And, but then for the rest of us, <laughs> that, was, that was number one. Now there's like seven more that have to go to college. And so it came down, it's like, well, What's wrong with Ohio State? And it turns out you can get a really great education at a state school. But the prevailing message is that you've got to get into one of the elite schools or you haven't arrived. And so how do we think about changing that, that message and really helping people understand how they can get this? It's not this, this commodity that's rare. And by perceiving it as such, you're undermining the ability of the elite colleges to do what they're designed to do, which is to create transformation, to create thinking, to create space. I just want, I have a daughter who's 24, I have a 10 year old. I want them in their college years to have space and time and protection to make mistakes and to kick the tires of life and come back and change their mind. Because the other thing that happens in this process, if you start in middle school cultivating, you get to high school, then you get to college, what happens when you change your mind? I, I thought I wanted to be in medicine, but it turns out I don't. But you pick your major before you've really had a lot of time to kick the tires. And you have all of these options. And decision-making theory says that you know, we, when you have all these options, college broadens your horizons, and it should. But then no one tells us how to narrow them down. And if you have, our decision information theory suggests when you have all the options, when you could be anything, the pressure to be something is enormous. If the world is your oyster, you better not squander it, is, is the underlying message which we find is, is where a lot of mental health issues and anxiety and depression, when people feel like they have all these options and they're not making good on it. And so that comes with all of this pressure. So if you're the, one of the elite who were chosen, then it only increases the pressures and it undermines our ability to do what we really want to do with a four-year college degree, which is to create thinkers, to create experimenters, to create problem solvers, to create divergent thinkers, to provide a context for cognitive flexibility where you can back out and try new things. But if you're on a treadmill, how do you get off? And that's what I want the undergraduate experience to be, is to, to let, let ourselves get off the treadmill so that we can think and create space. Fewer classes, more time for discussion. Thank you so much for that. A related question for uh, Dean Karana. 
in that same uh, resume of, of rejections, you mentioned undeserved grace. And I've heard you talk about it in other occasions. I wonder, uh, related to that sort of contradiction that I, I personally see in, in the uh, process of admission with the purpose of, of a college education, we often hear uh, in, in speeches about college admission, we often tell students, once they're admitted, you worked hard, you deserve to be here. And the whole idea of a highly selective process of admission generates this, or, this sort of ethic of chosenness. You're the chosen ones. It means you worked hard, harder than others. That's why you deserve here. That seems to uh, go in, in, that seems to contrast your, your ethic of undeserved grace. Am I, am I wrong? I mean, I, 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 I was trying to think of it as maybe more consistent that how much of our life is, you know, by things that we have no control over. Um, a few years ago, I gave a class day speech um, and was criticized very heavily by the Wall Street Journal for it because I used the metaphor of the game of Monopoly um, and, you know, like how Monopoly is supposed to teach you about capitalism and Monopoly is all about like skill and it's a metaphor for capitalism and merit. And then everybody forgets actually you have to roll dice in, in Monopoly. <laughs> that actually so much of it is luck. Uh, like my dad, Uganda, United States. Like, I mean, there could have been another country with a, you know, with a U that might not have had the same opportunities or possibilities. Um, I think it's, I think one of the challenges that we live in exactly, Professor Hill, to your point, that puts so much pressure as we've become a, a society that's so stratified in which, and I love our students and, you know, you know, and everybody, I'm so glad each of them are here and I'm so excited about what they're going to do with their lives. Uh, but there are lots of other students who also, you know, I think would have benefited from a Harvard education, and we have a limit on how many beds we have. Um, and I think the real question is, what do you do with it now that you're here? And I have a hard time with the word deserve, because at one level, the word deserve suggests that the people who have done have things that are good in their life deserve them, and that the people who don't have good things in their life deserve that too. And so I have a really hard time with the notion of deserve because there is so much serendipity and randomness that if we don't give that enough uh, uh, you know, thought, uh, it's important. And what's interesting about that randomness and that serendipity is that actually if you approach it academically, you actually see that it's not, some of it is explained by a lot of things that maybe we might feel uncomfortable about. So it used to be that when people, like in the early 1970s, looked at how people got jobs, it was a very famous paper that was written. And it was about, you know, there's something called human capital, and that was consisting of some natural talents plus your education. And then what they, the, this sociologist wrote as luck. And then later, people started studying luck. There was a guy named Mark Granovetter who wrote a book called Getting a Job. And it turns out luck was what were called the strength of weak ties, which was your networks. Now, networks are something that your family can pass on to you. They're things that you get in educational institutions, and that's where information flows and opportunities flow, and often flow much faster uh, than they do through formal job placements and statements. And so you start taking apart luck and serendipity, and you start thinking that underneath is, you know, a bias on discrimination. Then there's things like, uh, uh, you know, so people with the same education levels actually don't always have access to the same opportunities or don't get paid the same. Uh, they get paid, you know, percentage of what other people get paid for the same job. And then you start looking at the role of networks, and then you see that some jobs, especially some of the most highly compensated jobs, don't even formally list their job offers. Um, uh, and, and so you get them through sort of weak ties. And so you start really start disentangling. And then I think, you know, the idea deserve gets a little bit more scrutiny. Um, and I think we're learning that. And so I think that partly also explains why does, why do, why is this is emphasis on selective colleges so much is that you're absolutely right. You get out of college what you put in, but it does happen that increasingly the sort of role of these invisible factors, which we sort of attribute to merit, but have a lot more to do with sort of the invisible infrastructure of the reproduction of inequality, mm -hmm. play a pretty significant role in outcomes. And families are sophisticated about that. They understand that if you want a job in certain industries that 
that, 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 that the way those opportunities open up is through, oh, were you on this team? And somebody who later comes back and talks to the students on that team and tells them this is how you get the internship and this. Like, and so part of, I think, what our, our education can do, especially if we all approach it with humility, is then the question is, is I have this opportunity, I have these, how can I use it now? And again, use it toward the mission of trying to make the world a little bit more fair, a little bit more just, and also recognize that the advantages that I have, uh, yes, it's great you've worked hard, um, and I'm really happy for those advantages, but also not to make the attribution that people who don't have advantages somehow deserve the position that they're in. And in fact, what they need is they just haven't had often the same resources, the same networks. And so to me, part of this, like if we do our job well, um, I, I always encourage students, like, you know, I, I completely get it. You know, people want to look at their admissions file and figure out why me. And my sense is, like, you know, don't worry about that. Think about what you're going to do now. What can you do with this that, you know, would make you feel good about having been here, that you took advantage of the resources? And I completely agree with you, um, Professor Hill. Some of the smartest kids I knew like in middle school, in my Queens, New York middle school. Like, I mean, literally seventh graders. Like, they, I remember when Rubik's Cube was a new thing when I was a kid, so that's, what, that's how old I am. Um, and I remember this kid, Mark, and he looked at it and he goes, oh, I got it. And just like solved it in like about a minute. Something happened in Mark's family. Mark ended up not going, he went to community college, I, he's, I think he's fine, but you know, I would have put Mark any day. <laughs> he didn't have a lot of SAT prep classes. He didn't have any of that stuff. And so we have to just recognize that a lot of things happen for people along their lives that diverge their paths. And I think part of what we also have to, the last thing I'll say is that the educational caste system that is being developed in this country that is based on identification with a single type of college rather than just going to college is a very, very dangerous thing for our society. Um, it's, it's, it's also not healthy. We're not, we can't be brands. We can't, you know, like, again, to the interior life that if our identities are all about the affiliations of our organizations and our institutions, then where's the self in all of that? And I think so much of that, look, my mom drops the H-bomb all the time. I'm not, you know, she's like, oh, you know. Somebody says, pass the salt. My mom will say, oh, my son passes the salt in Cambridge. Like, you know, I get the Harvard. Like, but you, it is very, very dangerous uh, because it, it's, it, it comes with a lot of amplification of ideas and, and biases that we really need to make sure to be wary of. And I think as alums and as students, we can all kind of recognize that. And I think the more we model that, the better we'll be in kind of creating a healthier society. If I could ask one last question to Professor Hill before we open uh, the floor to the audience for questions. Uh, so Dean Karana was talking about merit and the emphasis on merit as possibly exacerbating systems of so social injustice and the value of undeserved grace as a way of acknowledging luck, the role of luck. Mm -hmm. Yet the, the, the notion of undeserved grace plays such a central uh, role in, in the Christian story. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned Paul and, and Romans earlier. Mm -hmm. And Paul invents the concept of undeserved grace mm -hmm. in the Christian story mm -hmm. as a way of acknowledging not just the role of luck, but the role of God mm -hmm. in our lives. And the fact that sometimes our natural talents are not just attributable to ourselves, and they're certainly not just for self-edification, mm -hmm. but they ought to be attributed to God. Is there a place for God and faith in a college education? Unmerited favor. That's grace. <laughs> and it is unmerited favor. And, and I completely agree with you, Dean Karana, that, you know, this idea of what we deserve. Grace means we don't get what we deserve. Because all the, the blessings and the good things that we have, we didn't deserve them. You know, we didn't work for hard enough for them. We didn't deserve them. And so how do we think about grace and God? In my view, I think of it two ways. One is in this understanding of truth. What is veritas? How do we find it? 
And as we pursue truth, it's fleeting. I don't think it's relative. I think it's hard to find. And I think the tools of our education, the scientific process, the lo logics process, help us to chip at a vision of it. And the more we press against it, and from Romans, test and discern, which means to ask questions. And there's never a question that's too tough for truth and, and God. And so I think about it in that way, as we pursue our, our education and we ask tough questions, we're pursuing this idea of truth. We don't deserve to find it, but sometimes we get unmerited favor. We get grace. And the other way in which I think about it is when I think about God as one who gives grace and one who gives mercy and particularly as we're, we're in the season of both you know, Passover and Easter, we're reminded of Passover, which is unmerited favor. And we're reminded of the sacrifice of Christ in the Judeo-Christian tradition of sacrificing himself, and we didn't deserve it. But the other part of it is that we can really push back when, when times are hard. It doesn't mean, believing in God doesn't mean that everything's going to go your way. But it does give you that sense of hope that Dean Karana talked, you talked about looking behind you and being able to find hope. And as I look behind me and see all that God has brought me through, all of the unmerited favor, all the ways in which things could have gone bad and many times they did, but to trust and believe that I'm still going to be okay because my faith isn't in things. It isn't in an education. I used to be embarrassed to say I went to Ohio State when I started teaching at Duke and came here. It was like, oh, 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 you went to Ohio State. <laughs> and then suddenly it was like, no, I went to Ohio State. <laughs> you know, and, and you know, this idea of, of um, how we make sense of failure, how we make sense of, of when things don't go our way. How, are we, how do we deal with discouragement? How do we find faith and hope to move forward? And in my view, we can't trust the things of this world because they will fail us. So who then do we trust? And that's where we, we intersect with, with truth and the pursuit of truth. And that's why I believe in God, not because someone told me to. It's from testing and discernment, trying it out, trying to understand. There are no questions that are too difficult to ask. If I can't ask this question or I can't, if I have to believe this without interrogating it, what am I doing? You know, to be a woman of faith means that I get to ask the tough questions and have faith that I'll get the answers, or I won't, or I will one day. But it's unmerited favor, and it's really a, a trust in a, around how we deal with failure, how we deal with disappointment, and what we're willing to lean in on. And I don't think anything in this world, from my view, is, is fail-safe for leaning in on. But modeling, you know, grace, Grace for myself, forgiving myself, for disappointing myself, forgiving others, being gracious in conversation with people who disagree with me, who staunchly disagree with me, that I really would rather not know their point of view. But grace makes me want to ask it and to know more and to love who they are, even though I disagree with them. Or That's where it comes from. All right, so let's uh, open it up to uh, the audience for questions for our speakers. We have a microphone in the room. Uh, feel free to just raise your hand and we'll come to you with a microphone. Yeah, 
Yeah, I think it's interesting to have this conversation within the context of Harvard, um, right? And we've we've touched on this idea of an educational caste system and on, you know, just how many people are applying to, to Harvard, especially the college. I'm curious what you think Harvard is getting right about education. Is Harvard getting anything right? Is it is it just this kind of caste system approach that makes Harvard such an attractive place to go to school? Are there things Harvard is really getting right about education that make it so appealing? And like what, if anything, is Harvard getting wrong or could it could it get better? Think around. Yeah, you know, so when I was saying, I think, you know, there's an institutional system. It's not Harvard specific. I think it's very much you use the term selective colleges and 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 I think that's a I think Harvard gets a lot of things right. I mean, I wouldn't have let me into Harvard. Um, uh, so, you know, I think, it was, I mean, I think our students, you know, I think we do a really good job. I think when I meet our students, I, I, I sort of see some pretty common sort of elements in certain ways. There's also uniqueness and differences. Everybody's uh, unique. One is a kind of intellectual curiosity. I, 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 I it's just, it's not just students are s smart, which they are, but they're curious. So it's more than just smart. It's like wanting to know more. It's asking the searching question. It's asking the why. It's getting to the first principles. The second is I see our students are pretty energetic um, in a way like the, the, it, it, it's, it's ambitious, but in a positive way. Like, like I want to do something. I want to I see something through. I want to have an impact. I want to bring other people into it. And I like that aspect. It's not just, again, doing the minimum necessary. It's kind of thinking about how does this, you know, how do I turn something, you know, plausible into something that's possible? And how would I sort of, you know, diffuse that? And then the third is a sense of service that I think is a sense that it's got to be about something more than this. And it's kind of a, a kind of micro version of, it's not really a midlife crisis. I had a colleague who described it as a kind of a decade crisis, which is like, okay, some version of, you know, what happens in midlife is, you know, you, you accomplish some of the sort of successes that as the world defines it and then you sort of ask yourself is this all there is but I've had as faculty dean the same conversations with students who've gotten into Harvard and they say so is this all there is is this going to just be rewind and play again over and over in life for graduate school and then uh, to the next stage and I think you know what we get right is people who kind of really want to do that I think what we also get right is faculty uh, who actually really love being on this journey um, as role models or students, staff who care deeply about this. Um, like any institution, I think we're in the process of becoming. Um, so, you know, Harvard has museums, but it should never become one. Um, and I think part of that, I would say, is, you know, when we look at our history, Harvard was not as inclusive as it should have been and still could be. Mm -hmm. um, so we know, like, that our aspirations run ahead of our reality. Um, but I think that's a good modeling for our students. None of our sort of institutions, I think, are where they should be. I would say another thing that I think we also recognize uh, is that this search uh, for the truth, and you know, I, I said I was religiously unmusical, but I don't think that means that we don't we shouldn't create the space for um, what I would put under the more of a category of personal transformation, um, you know, in which I think that you know the search for spiritual, uh, whatever that means to one and how one approaches that, uh, but some sense that. You know, it's got to be, you know, again, I, I feel I don't really have the facility with language here. And, you know, it's hard for me to think about how the author of the universe sort of plays things out. But I think giving our students the tools to answer those questions, not give them the answers, but the tools so they can live their way to the answers mm -hmm. is really, really important. And I think that we shouldn't limit that toolkit. Um, and I think there's a lot of things that, you know, we don't know and leave open the possibility um, for. And, and I think that would be doing our, our, our community a service. Uh, you, know, um, they're, they're, you know, what does it mean to be good? Mm -hmm. What does it mean to be just? Uh, you know, at a high level, we can all agree on them. But once we start, like, saying, well, your definition of the good and my definition of the good might be different, your definition of the just and my definition of just may be different. And I think creating that dialogue is also the thing that we get right. I always worry, though, the last point I would make, is that if we get to a place where that dialogue and that 
questioning and the is 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 not allowed and it kind of goes back to my introductory remarks um, this enterprise stops making sense um, because then we are simply a certification mechanism then we simply are a sorting mechanism and that to me is not the kind of institution that I would want to be part of and if I ever felt that we had become that I think it would be it would cause me to pause about a lot of different things uh, so you know right now we live in a system in which it starts in kindergarten as you said of you know uh, how you get to Harvard nobody gets to Harvard by accident but if if that was just the end game in itself that it was a sort of stamp or, or golden passport that sort of allowed you entry that I think that we really have to revisit the, the allocation of society's resources to institutions that if, if they just engage in that simple credentialing game any other questions we have Time for maybe another question or two. Dean Corona, I remember in freshman year, you told us we should be prepared for um, a transformative experience that um, where, where we should um, find people whose beliefs are different from ours and then challenge our own beliefs, etc. And I'm curious, after years of being the Dean, have you experienced a similar transformative experience yourself? And how has your perspective of education changed? That's Wonderful great, question. <laughs> so yeah, you know, and I, I, I contrasted the transformational experience with what I call the transactional experience. And, and I think, you know, that was a, and it was a choice. I think it's a choice that we have to make. How is my sense? You know, I have to say that I have the best job in the world. I, I, you know, I, 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 cha I really do believe I have the best job in the world. Like to be a person who gets to be around faculty colleagues like this with students, you know, like yourself. I, I, I literally see the world with new eyes every day, and I think that's such a gift. Um, and and um, I think how I've thought about it is that I think that some of the things that I thought were easy are actually a lot harder. Um, in this world for our students. I think things that I've seen happen during my time as dean is I've seen the rungs of inequality grow. Mm -hmm. And so that makes the feeling of like choices and jobs and careers much harder. I think we don't get across the message of what you're preparing to learn is to learn for life and you know, but I do think that's a harder thing. I, I feel like the other thing that I didn't have a full appreciation of is the strange interaction between well-meaning schools and parents and how that constant gaze of judgment didn't create, I think, and it's unintentional, the space for playfulness mm -hmm. and the space for joy in a way that was more spontaneous rather than structured. Um, I, th I feel that one of the things I didn't understand is how bureaucratized uh, childhood had become. Uh, that, you know, that, that um, the Max Weber's Iron Cage now increasingly started with kindergarten or even preschool. And most of our students have largely only been in organized activities. And then we shouldn't then be puzzled by like why they list basically being accomplished organizational people on their resume, I formed this organization, I was the president of this, I mean, it's like literally like, it reads like a resume of, you know, an exercise in, I mean, what I teach, which is bureaucracy. And, 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 and then we're picking people on how good bureaucrats they are. And then, like, it's a really strange, you know, kind of challenge to then, because I think also, you know, how you, the, the Max Weber called this the iron cages, how do you break that apart? Um, because in it is the loss of personality, is the loss of playfulness, it's the loss of spontaneity, uh, which I think is kind of what also makes us human. It's really good to organize, uh, but it's not good to become an organization, <laughs> um, if that makes sense. And I think there's a lot of things like that which I didn't fully appreciate. Um, and um, But at the end of the day, I would just say that, you know, I am really like, actually quite optimistic about the future, not naively optimistic, but like ruggedly optimistic about our students because 
I literally feel like I look into your eyes and I see the future and I feel really hopeful uh, uh, about it. Professor Hill, if I could ask you also a, as a conclusion, conclusive remarks about the future. How do you feel about the future? Well, like Dean Corona, I, I am hopeful about the future. I am, um, I'm hopeful about the future because I understand where we've been and I understand the progress that we've made. Um, I've lived long enough to see progress on the things we care about around justice, around equity, around access. And back to one of the questions about what Harvard gets right and what they get wrong. Once you're in Harvard, there's so much that's done right. And what's wrong with it is that so few get it. And I think by naming it and understanding it, I'm hopeful about the future because I think we can give it away. That if we can name these things around the purpose of education post-COVID is that we've really learned to name the things we value about education that are not training transactional facts. We've learned what it means to value community, to value being engaged with one another. We have wept over the inequities that exist. We've wept over, even in our, our own vicinity, the differences in, in issues and problems and access in K-12 education in Boston public schools in the context of the pandemic compared to some of our wealthier suburbs like you know, Lexington or Wellesley where they went seamlessly into online education. The inequities and injustices are much clearer as we can see them. We can see them and we can define them. And we have a better sense of those intangible things that we value around education, that we can name them and we can then give them away and make them more broadly accessible. I'm hopeful about education post-pandemic because the pandemic broke it apart. It broke the whole thing apart. And in the context of being broken apart, we can choose how to put it back together. And in that choice, both in higher education and in K-12 education, we can choose how we put it back together. We don't have to break it to fix it. It's already broken open for us. And so I'm optimistic that we can name it and redesign it and put it back together in a way that, that really honors who we are as, as humans and humanity.